Hey folks, welcome back to Top Africa. This is Chris coming here live once again from central Pennsylvania. Wherever you find yourself around the planet, whether it's here in North America or perhaps you find yourself somewhere in Africa, that'd be nice to see who's in Africa or even Asia. You know, we have viewers in Nepal, South Korea, New Zealand, Australia, China even. So wherever you find yourself today, welcome. Um, I hope that you've tuned in for what should be an interesting conversation. My guest, I'll do a brief introduction of him and then we'll get him on here. And we're going to be talking about a book project that he and I worked on that was sponsored by Stellenbosch University in South Africa. And I hope you find that interesting, talking about the, the origins and formations of U.S. Africa Command. And uh, let me just get to that in just a moment. But uh, my guest today will be Ambassador Michael Battle, uh, who is the former U.S. Ambassador to the U.S. Mission to the African Union, the USAU. Uh, that's a place I served at, but unfortunately, I didn't have the privilege of serving under Ambassador Battle. I served there later under Ambassador Brigadier. Um, I was a senior military advisor in that role, and that was my last tour in Africa as a foreign area officer in Africa. So it's one I'll remember. But um, Ambassador Michael Battle uh, is uh, a man of faith and uh, was a chaplain in the reserve forces, if I recall correctly. And he served the U.S. Mission in the African Union. So we're going to talk a little bit about, um, about his uh, past, his experiences, and uh, who knows, maybe even a little bit lockdown. You never know. And then also specifically about the book. Um, and, and this isn't to shield the book, folks. It's an academic book. If you, if you want it, it's 160 bucks on Amazon or at Walmart. You can get it or get the Kindle edition. But we're really here to talk about um, this topic of U.S. Africa Command. And I haven't done that in a while. So anyway, let's get started, folks. Let me welcome in right now Ambassador Michael Battle. Sir, how are you today? I'm doing extremely well, Chris. Uh, I wish our paths had crossed at USAU, but you served under my uh, successor, who is an extremely wonderful guy and friend of mine, Ambassador Ruben Brigadier. Yeah, no, he's absolutely top, top drawer. It was a great experience. A uh, Navy veteran. Uh, uh, he was in the Navy. I went to the Naval Academy, did quite well there, and then uh, went in academia after his time in the Navy. Uh, was at George Mason for a while. And uh, I think he's, is he an American now? He's, he was at Georgetown uh, as a dean, and now he's president of a college, uh, the University of the South. That's the one. Okay, that's where he's at. Yeah, he's he's he's, he's in demand. It's hard to keep up, you know, keep up where he's going. <laughs> Yeah, we, we flip-flopped. I was president of an academic institution before becoming an ambassador, and he left the ambassadorial post and became president of an academic institution. So we had been operating in reverse. Well, there you go. It's, uh, that is, well, I have to say this. Uh, in the chat real quick, I'm going to mention this. One of, one of the, uh, the, the viewers in the chat has said that, um, he said, Chris Wyatt, the clean-cut military look is much better than the hillbilly one. He's referring to your clean-cut and my apparent... Um, but this isn't hillbilly. This is John Brown, the abolitionist look. That's what this is. <laughs> <laughs> in the tradition of my ancestors, seven of my great-great-grandfathers fought in Union regiments. Uh, of my eight great-great-grandfathers, seven mm -hmm. fought in Union regiments from Maryland and West Virginia in the Civil War. So um, they probably would have um, liked John Brown. Maybe not so much. He was a rabble-rouser, but his... In Tet was good, I think. I hope. Anyway, with that in mind, uh, so uh, you you are, you are a man of faith, um, and uh, you um, were a chaplain in the reserves. Am I correct? Yes, I was a chaplain in the Army Reserve for 20 years. Uh, when I was in uh, seminary at Duke, I had determined that I would go into the uh, military as an active duty chaplain. Mm -hmm. But by the time I graduated from Duke and before my paperwork was finalized for the Army chaplaincy, I got a job offer as a university chaplain at Hampton University. Uh -huh. And so that job and uh, decided, well, I will do the reserve uh, uh, as my military obligation and serve as an academic uh, chaplain as my uh, paycheck obligation. Well, that's a pretty awesome path to do. I, it's, uh, I, I have to say this. Um, it's interesting for me because throughout my career, I, I'm 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 not a person that uh, goes frequently. I did it in my youth, of course, uh, go to church frequently. But of course, I have my faith, and it, it's it's a matter of personal thing for me. But um, I always seem to gravitate towards the religious services and uniform in the field. When we were in the field and chaplains were out there, uh, both for me it was a sign of uh, respect and support for the chaplain what they're doing for our troops. But also it was it was kind of nice to have a, a service in the field when you're out on deployment or maneuver, something like that. So uh, for me, having chaplains around was always a nice thing. I, I remember hearing people say, why are there chaplains in the military? I'm like, clearly you've never served in uniform. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, I, I used to tell people because people will always ask me, they say, chaplain battle, why is it that your chapel services are always packed? Whether I was in the field or uh, on post as uh, uh, in the chapel on post, whether in my reserve or when we were doing AT. And I would always say, 
my chapel services were packed because the troops saw me out in the field. When they did a 25 mile road march, I was out there. When they were uh, crawling in the sand and in dirt and in the dust and the mud, I was out there with them. When they were doing overnight bivouac, I was out there. So if you're with the troops, when the troops are doing what they do well, they will come to you on Sunday morning and worship in chapel. So I had packed chapels all the time because I was engaged with the troops outside of uh, the chapel. And I always found that to be quite refreshing. And chaplains in the military, when they do their job well, you're not doing exclusively a religious job. You are working with young men and women who are wrestling with life issues, much of which are connected with faith, but a lot of which have no connection whatsoever with faith as a strict definition, but have to do with growing up with becoming a person. And so chaplains served in that role. We were the only officers who had as much access to a basic trainee as we did to a uh, commanding general. And you were able to move up and down the ladder without worrying about violating rank structure. That's what that's what's so beautiful about being a, 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 a military chaplain. You know, it's interesting that you say that, uh, Ambassador, because um, I think it's absolutely spot on. I think a lot of people don't realize, and that's I didn't really get to that that point, but I mean, I just kind of left it open. You described it very well. Is that, and I said someone that, that asked that question clearly hasn't served in uniform because, as you you highlighted, you have a lot of young people come in. That's the majority of the troops in the army and the military, I should say, and um, overwhelming percentage is young folks. And there ma there's a maturation process there. They're still growing up. They're still becoming young men and young women. And, um, you know, um, you like to, to have this um, tough exterior in uniform, whether you're a man or a woman, you want to prove your mettle in uniform. And nobody likes to look, give the appearance of weak. And, and so a lot of people mm -hmm. are reticent to go talk to a counselor, you know, uh, a, you know, a medical professional, but chaplains are there and, and they're there for a purpose. And, you know, most people don't recognize also that a, 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 an army chaplain minimally has seven years of higher education uh, four years of college and three years of seminary. And many of us have done uh, pastoral education, pastoral counseling, uh, courses in psychology. Uh, I did both uh, civilian uh, pastor, CPE, clinical pastoral education at Duke University Hospital, and also uh, military CPE at Walter Reed uh, Hospital. So the ability to counsel, the ability to be present, most of all, the ability to relate to people in the middle of struggle, that ministry of presence is what made it effective for me. And to be a university chaplain at the same time, I was dealing with young people who were deeply engaged in academic struggles. I taught philosophy. Uh, logic and scientific method was my primary course uh, at Hampton University. Mm -hmm. So dealing with uh, academic issues that young people were dealing with and also with the life issues that young soldiers were dealing with gave me a more well-rounded life, I thought. So I got as much out of serving the men and women in uniform as they got from my presence. Jeez, I, th I think we're going to have to invite you back and just have a conversation about chaplaincy. I mean, <laughs> okay, good. let's talk about the book. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm just saying this. I, I want to keep going with this conversation. We're not going to have to do that, but it's, it's, uh, well, you know, I, just before we get to the book and, and, and before that, I want to talk about the USAU and your, your, because uh, becoming an ambassador is a pretty awesome thing. Uh, it, it may be a frustrating thing at times in the job, but it's a pretty awesome thing to do it. But, but I would did want to say is that, you know, when I started this channel last year, one of the big reasons I did it, people asked me to go, because they watched my prepare videos, like, why don't you do live streams? And I started doing them and people like, yeah, this is what people want. And, and, and I realized that because I was focused on Africa, of course, it's Chris White Africa, although now I've branched into the U.S., which is a little more controversial U.S. politics. When, <laughs> and you and I wouldn't agree on some of that political stuff, but that's we're adults, so we don't worry about that. But um, sure. but uh, I started doing it because I was honestly concerned um, in March of last year when the South Africa declared a lockdown and people were basically prisoners in their homes about people's mental health, their welfare, about gender-based violence, domestic violence, incest. Nobody ever talks about that. But predators have access to their children 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I mean, it's, it's a really disgusting topic to talk about. But all of these social ills that would now be magnified by people being trapped in their homes and around each other. And in South Africa, a lot of people, millions living in informal structures. I mean, talk, I mean, if you go back to your 1,800 square foot or 10,000 square foot mansion uh, with electricity and air conditioning, that's one thing. But if you have to go to your tin shack or your government provided house or you live in a farm or rural area, 
my concern was about so, people's social welfare and their mental their mental health, and and that's another reason why I've continued uh, the streams. Uh, it's a lot of work doing two streams every day, but a lot of people constantly write to me and go, "Thanks a lot. We really appreciate your streams. The guests you bring are really fascinating. It gives us a chance to unwind and, and and talk about something different. Even when you talk about politics, we find that entertaining. So for me, uh, I'm obviously not a chaplain, and I, that's not my vocation or calling. But but I appreciate the need for I don't know. Maybe this is this the right phrase? Spiritual well being. Well, uh, yeah, spiritual well-being, spiritual wholeness, um, uh, just wholeness of a person, uh, spiritual, psychological, mental, emotional, uh, physical, the whole nine yards dealing with people. You know, one can never isolate from a human Mm -hmm. their mental well-being from their physical well-being or from their spirit. We are whole entities. And so there's a sense in which all of us must be in some sense of harmony in order to succeed. You know, you, you, you speak about uh, the pandemic and uh, the lockdown in South Africa and in many other parts of the African continent. I did a Zoom, oh, about a month and a half ago with a group of African sociologists and, uh, and counselors. And we were talking about the effect of the pandemic and, and what lockdown meant. And that when one is living in a structure, either in South Africa or in Ethiopia or any of the other part of the African continent, where you have families of people living in what is the size of an American living room, yes. you, have, you cannot have six feet of separation. No. And if you live in a place where uh, running water is not accessible as it is in the Western world, you cannot wash your hands 15 or 20 times a day uh, because it's just not feasible. So what we were trying to look at is different modalities for people to remain healthy uh, based upon their own existential circumstances. And one set of modality will not fit every situation. So there has to be a difference in modality. And that was a real meaningful uh, conversation about how to adjust based upon what one's reality uh, happens to be. But I'm hopeful, you know, I I got my first shot of the uh, uh, Pfizer uh, vaccine, and I'm gonna get the second shot uh, sometime mid February. Uh, I'm hopeful that with uh, vaccinations happening here in the US and also being made available around the world, that we will be able to put this pandemic behind us and manage it as we manage the annual annual flu shot or something like that. Uh, we, we cannot remain as social beings in total isolation for uh, too long a period of time. No, absolutely. Well, um, you had the vaccination and uh, just for my audience's confirmation, I don't see any third arms growing. Uh, no, <laughs> you know, four, four of my sisters are, are nurses and mm-hmm. one of them, uh, one sister is the vice president of the University of Chicago uh, health system. And uh, uh, be after nursing, she uh, did a master's in, in business administration. So uh, I take my cue from the four nursing sisters of mine uh, more than from anything and anybody else. Well, there you go. That's pretty cool. Uh, well, you know, I almost had um, flashbacks there. You started talking about uh, the modalities, uh, the different circumstances, people, you know, eight or 10 people in one room and, um, you know, obviously uh, fetching water from a, a well or something like that. And it took me back to when I was in high school, you know, living in a trailer and uh, having eight, 10 people sleep in the same room and fetching water from a cistern and using outhouse at minus 20 in the wintertime to go to the bathroom. Yeah. Okay. We'll move on from that story, but, uh, okay. <laughs> but uh, let's, so let's jump ahead for a little bit here. Um, you were appointed by uh, President Obama to become uh, the uh, ambassador to the African Union, U.S. mission to the African Union, yes? Yes. Uh, you know, prior to being appointed as U.S. ambassador to the African Union, I had a very deep uh, record in Africa engagement. Mm-hmm. I was the vice chairman of the board of uh, the American Committee on Africa. Uh, and I had also served as an election observer when Nelson Mandela was elected as the first president of Free South Africa. Interestingly enough, I interviewed F.W. de Klerk on the day of the election, and he and I had a a very good conversation, and I said to him, Mr. President, how do you feel about being challenged in this election? And his response to me was something that I admired 
from him. Mm. He said, look, my only interest is that I have announced that under my watch, we will have free and fair elections in South Africa. What we're doing now is we're having a free and fair election in South Africa. And he said, that is my only concern. And it was myself and some others who were uh, in conversation with him. And then I met him again at the African Union uh, when he was engaged in something with uh, Mbeki. Mm -hmm. And I reminded him of that conversation. So yeah, I had, and I also led a number of study tours uh, on the African continent uh, with uh, theologians who were doing uh, studies of Islam, uh, uh, Judaism, and Christianity, and also doing analysis of some of the indigenous religions on the African continent. So when Barack Obama asked if I would serve as an ambassador, and my response was, I would be happy to do it, uh, but I want to serve somewhere that the work is going to be hard, it's going to be meaningful and it's going to be relevant to the overall uh, issues that the administration wants to carry. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, it'll take about three or four weeks before we decide where we want to assign you. But the very next day they said, OK, we want you to go to the African Union. And I said, OK, let's let's roll. And that's how I ended up uh, in Addis Ababa for four years. Yeah. The longest serving U.S. ambassador to the AU uh, in uh, history at this point. Yeah, I remember. I was beginning to wonder if anyone else is allowed to have that job. You're doing so well there. <laughs> <laughs> of course, when you were in Otis, I was all over the continent. I moved a couple of times in that right. time frame. But uh, right. yeah, so um, if I can, just very quickly, just ask about that. What was that experience like for you? I mean, relatively spe speaking, it was relatively new, the AU, because the OAU had not gone away too long before that. And the U.S. was the first uh, country to give diplomatic recognition to the African Union and establish relations with the, Af the African Union. So what was that like for you? And uh, you weren't... You weren't the first, were you? I mean, was Cindy Corva there? No, before? I wasn't. Cindy, uh, Cindy, uh, Cindy Corva was Cindy there before Corva you. I was first. Yeah, yes. she was there before and you, so you were the served, second. Right, right. She was served. She served for about uh, uh, a little less than two years, I think. Yeah, I think but years. what what it was like, you know, when I first went to USAU, the U.S. government was still questioning the viability of the mission, mm -hmm. uh, whether or not it was uh, uh, sustainable, and my function was to either build it where it would be sustainable or help recognize that it was not going to be a sustainable exercise. I've always taken the uh, point of view that if you're given an opportunity to build and make something significant, then you do so. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I wanted to formalize the relationship between the United States and the African Union, because prior to then, it had only been um, uh, sort of a loose relationship, no formal documents had been signed. So we were able to uh, construct with the African Union's engagement and with a whole of government engagement in the US, a memorandum of understanding between the US and the African Union, which then gave uh, uh, coverage for what we were doing uh, militarily, socially, uh, even with the now African Union CDC. I was engaged in those initial conversations with the US CDC about how to help the African continent develop a Centers for Disease Control. So we did a whole lot of things, structured it, made it formal, and the uh, uh, mission grew. And in my second year, at USAU, the United States decided it was time to re-engage with the UNECA, um, the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa. Mm -hmm. So my portfolio was expanded to include the being U.S. ambassador to the African Union and uh, U.S. permanent rep to the UNECA. And in my third year at Addis, I became co-chair of the AUPG, the African Union Partners Group. So because I was co-chair of the African Union Partners Group, all of the non-African nations that supported the African Union and uh, a representative to UNECA and ambassador to the AU, I got to work with all of the uh, multilateral organizations to include the African uh, Development Bank. Mm -hmm. And the African Development Bank work happened because of my AUPG role. Uh, so it. Well, by the time I left uh, USAU, 
uh, Johnny Carson, who was the Assistant Secretary of State, said to me that no one questions the viability of USAU anymore. Uh, and I took that as been a major um, a sense of, 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 of the accomplishment that we were allowed to do uh, working with a good staff. The staff was built up. We did a whole lot of uh, excellent things. We had great relationships with the AU uh, Commission, as well as with a number of the presidents on the African continent. I got to meet and engage with a number of the presidents on the African continent, as well as the African Union Commission. Well, yeah, I'd have to agree with the, the assessment that Johnny Carson, Ambassador Carson, said there about um, no one questioned the viability. I mean, I do remember that time frame and, and people uh, when Bush created the mission, like what's right. you know, what I mean, what what I mean, what, you know, what what uh, people were actually saying it in that fashion. I mean, even less articulately than I just did. And, right. And, and, and I, I uh, we obviously could see the, the utility and, and I think arguably the need for a mission at the African Union. Um, the one I guess a lot of people probably, probably didn't see, including um, the previous administration and then the Obama administration recognized later on, was it uh, the need to have um, your position also be accredited for the United Nations Economic Commission there? Because a lot of right. people don't even know that it's located in Addis Ababa, if they even know it exists. Yeah. 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 You know, and, and, and because of that, uh, but first of all, let me give credit to George W. Bush, yeah. which I do in the article that I did in the book. Uh, and I did that intentionally mm -hmm. because George W. Bush had a vision of the value of multilateral diplomacy mm -hmm. that no other president prior to him had been able to see vis-a-vis uh, -vis the African continent. So George Bush, Condoleezza Rice, and Jendaya Frazier, who uh, at that time was the Assistant Secretary uh, for Africa, a Republican administration with a keen understanding of the necessity to work collaboratively with African nations. And interestingly enough, Bush's orientation was never a paternalistic orientation. Bush saw Africa as, a, as strategically as well as tactically important. And he wanted to build relationships because he saw Africa to be important. Important not only to the US, but important to itself and because Africa was important to itself, it was important to the global community. So he took significant risk in uh, starting USAU. And I was really pleased that um, President Obama saw the uh, wisdom of what Bush did. And I think one of the reasons that the Bushes and the Obamas are personally close as they are and, you know, people talk about the relationship between Michelle Obama and George W. Bush and about the fact that they have a genuine closeness. It is an authentic closeness. And part of that authentic closeness developed because of their seeing a common vision for the African continent, as well as a common vision for the U.S. engagement in a constructive way in the global community. Uh, one of the things that I, I, I said in the article, but was taken out of the article and put in the footnotes was that um, uh, George Bush benefited from having a president follow him who saw the need for continuity and who saw the need to work collaboratively on a vision that was already in place. Unfortunately, uh, and this has nothing to do with one's politics, mm -hmm. But unfortunately, uh, Donald Trump did not see that same uh, a need for continuity and connectivity between what previous presidents had done. Uh, uh, had he done so, he would have been able to see that there had been a consistent bipartisan, as many Republicans as Democrats, as many Democrats as Republicans supported the need to work collaboratively with Africa. One of the things that amazed me most, uh, 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 Johnny Isaacson, mm -hmm. a white Republican from Georgia, who was a friend of mine uh, prior to my becoming an ambassador because he was in charge of uh, educational development in the state of Georgia because of his senatorial seat. And I was president of an academic institution in Georgia. So I have a good relationship with this, uh, Johnny Isaacson. But Johnny Isaacson, a white male Republican from Georgia, and Karen Bass, an African-American woman congressperson from California, both were together in Addis Ababa working collaboratively on plans for the development of the African continent. So my praise of Bush, 
Uh, it's not because he was a Republican. My praise of Obama is not because he was a Democrat, but because both of them saw the need for U.S. engagement with the African continent. One of my viewers has asked a question, USAU. Uh, what that is, is United States Mission to the African Union. That's the acronym we use for our diplomatic mission in Addis Ababa that represents U.S. strategic interests, well, all U.S. interests, with the African Union. Uh, so that's uh, that's uh, just for one of the viewers there, so I understand that. Um, yeah, I think they thought, um, uh, they were confused by it. But so that's what that is. Well, you know, you mentioned something there about, um, about uh, the wisdom of creating things. Um, when Bush created Africa Command, there was, of course, we're going to get to that. We're going to talk about the book in just a second. There was a lot of consternation about it. He's undermining African sovereignty. They're going to take over Africa. And it's all about military bases. It's about, you know, oil and resources. And um, it's interesting because um, there was a lot of programs that Bush came up with that still continue to this day that were rather groundbreaking, um, whether you like Bush or dislike him. I'm, I'm not, in the interest of full disclosure, not a major fan of George Bush, um, one way or the other. But uh but uh, the programs he did in Africa, the United, the President's Emergency Program for AIDS Relief, uh, PEPFAR, which is a global program, but mo most of the benefit is accrued to Africa, the Millennium Challenge account, and so many other things. Um, it took a while, but finally intervening in Liberia after people dumped uh, bodies in front of uh, Wellington Apartments, but we finally got engaged there. And a number of other uh, accomplishments around the country. After Bush really, I mean... Uh, you've been all over the continent. Um, whenever I go place in Africa, people that, that know what's happening in Africa, I, I, some people revere George Bush in Africa. People, a lot of people, deeply, they, they deeply respect him for what he did in Africa. And I, I would argue that he's done more vis-a-vis -vis Africans than any president, including Obama, in our history. Uh, that, that's a personal view. But And again, I'm not a big fan of George Bush. I'm just, I think I'm trying to be objective. Right. Well, you know, um, I, I am a, uh, a Democrat uh, I'm, I'm also a, um, a fan of George W. Bush because of his Africa policy. And uh, there were some things that George W. Bush did that I significantly disagree with. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, there were a number of things that George W. Bush did uh, that were significantly important. I had the opportunity of meeting his father mm. uh, when he uh, spoke at Hampton University and I was um, uh, the university chaplain there. I also met his father when uh, a close friend of mine, uh, Congressman uh, Herb Bateman, back a long time ago was the uh, congressman of the first congressional district in uh, Virginia, a Republican congressman who was a, a good personal friend. Uh, I was invited to do the invocation for a program <clears throat> that Ronald Reagan was to uh, come and speak, but Ronald Reagan could not come and George H.W. Bush came. So I met him on, on, on those two occasions. But, you know, Clinton, Bush and Obama had very proactive Africa programs. Mm -hmm. uh, Clinton was the first president to assemble all of the foreign ministers on the African continent. Uh, for a, a structured meeting. Uh, Bush, I mean, his record is just unmatched in terms of what he did on the African continent, which is why he's so revered. Uh, Obama was the first president to bring together all of the African heads of state and to start the U.S. Africa Leaders Summit. And Michelle Obama and Laura Bush worked hand in glove on the first lady's part of the African uh, uh, Leaders Summit. And their relationship continues to this day. So we've had great opportunity. Now, just to go back a little bit further, sure. Ronald, Ronald Reagan did something on the African continent that unfortunately goes unnoticed. Reagan intentionally appointed the first person of color as U.S. ambassador to, the, to um, South Africa. Mm -hmm. And he did it because he knew it would shake South Africa up while Reagan was talking about this non-engagement and non-interference, constructive and engagement, time, he was making a bold, bold, bold statement by putting not only a person of color, but a person of color who was observably and noticeably a person of color mm -hmm. as the U.S. ambassador to South Africa, which really shook things up. And Nelson Mandela often talked about how important it was that Ronald Reagan made that move. So we have had a history of presidents who have been engaged positively on the African continent and a tremendous history of Congress people and senators being engaged on the African continent. And we need to go back to that. 
uh, for Africa's sake, for the global community's sake, and for the U.S. sake. Well, I, 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 I definitely one thing I can't dis- cannot disagree with there is that we certainly have a a reasonably high level of congressional engagement in the continent because I've had to deal with one congressional delegation after another working yeah, yeah. working in eight different embassies in Africa. It's uh, always a joy to deal with those, um, and you know what I'm talking about. There, we won't share that with the audience. Yeah, yeah. They, they, they they're important, but they can be quite painful just uh, preparing for them and making them happen. Uh, folks, you're listening to Chris White Africa here on the Adaba Africa Channel, part of the Adaba Broadcasting Network. On Thursday, the 4th of February, 2021, can you imagine that, folks? It's been 15 months since Wuhan broke out in uh, China. And uh, here we are now over a year since Trump first uh, started the travel ban, January 31st last year. And we're still dealing with this pandemic. But today we're talking not about that specifically. We're talking about this new book that's just come out that Ambassador Michael Battle and uh, my guests and I were involved in. Now, before I ask you, I'm, I'm going to share this with you so I can get your thoughts. But now the book we're talking about, this is from Stellenbosch University. It was printed by Rutledge Press. And the title is Expanding U.S. Military Command in Africa, Elites, Networks, and Grand Strategy. Now, I received an email when I was the Director of African Studies at the Army War College. And it said, hey... <laughs> we'd like you to participate in this book project on U.S. Africa Command. Would you be interested in that? And I was busy, as you can imagine, three different sheets of the way. But I mean, you know, it's, it's always it's humbling and nice to be asked to participate in an academic project like this. And so I just finished another book project with U.S. War College when this one came along. And uh, I was curious. Um, I looked at the list of authors and I don't think I saw your name on there yet. Uh, there was, right. yeah, there was, there was, there was like almost no Americans involved. And, and they're going to write a book about the U.S., military and Africa command U.S. government. And not not that people would be skewed, but uh, I thought it was important to have views from inside the wire, so to speak, and from outside the wire. So I didn't agree to it. I asked a couple questions. And about three weeks later, I got an email saying, congratulations, we're excited. All of you volunteered to be part of this book project. I'm like, wait a second. I didn't volunteer. I just asked the question. I wanted to know a little bit more. But then when I saw your name was affiliated with, I'm like, okay, good. We've got some inside the wire from a military, and in your case, military and diplomatic, but from military and diplomatic perspective. And, and I felt good about that. So how did you get involved in the project? Well, you know, uh, when I left Washington, I went to Cincinnati and I was the uh, vice pres- executive vice president and provost of the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center, dealing with issues of freedom, uh, uh, both uh, in the U.S. and worldwide, and uh, combating slavery, uh, modern day slavery, and dealing with the story of historical slavery. So when I first got um, uh, an invitation to participate in the book, I turned it down because I was doing other things at that point. And then when I uh, left the Freedom Center and decided to retire uh, in January of 2017, uh, I looked at it a second time and they were saying, well, we need to really have somebody from the U.S. And I had uh, either I recommended or somehow Ruben Brigadier's name came up. And so uh, uh, Ruben was at that time a dean at doing issues in foreign studies. So I figured he would be the logical person to do it. And for whatever reason, uh, Ruben was um, not able to do uh, the chapter. And so they came back to me and said, OK, would you please do this? And I said, well, if I do it, I'm going to talk about uh, multilateral diplomacy. I'm going to talk about uh, the uh, favorability of what uh, my impression of, of AFRICOM is on the African continent. And they agreed to that. So I said, let's lock and load and, and get it done. And so I was happy to do it. And particularly now that I have a copy of the book and I've read through the book uh, and your chapter and my chapter, I think, <laughs> We try to balance yeah. multiple chapters that have a different point of view. Mm. And I think we successfully balanced it. Uh, your conversations about uh, the history and origins of what was going on when AFRICOM was being uh, formed and about uh, some of the uh, things that may have been able to be done a little bit better than it was. And what I was trying to do was to show that AFRICOM had a role and responsibility that was beyond what people normally classify as military. It's more than guns and bullets. Uh, AFRICOM was engaged in trying to train 
African uh, 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 militaries on how to be professional militaries, which means how to deal with things like floods and famines and uh, national catastrophes, how to get aid and relief out to people, how to communicate well. Uh, one of the things that we did when I was at USAU with uh, General Farrell, uh, General Farrell was helping us, and General Farrell at that time was a one-star stationed at AFRICOM who later became a three-star prior to retiring, uh, helped to put together a communication system that allowed African uh, uh, militaries to communicate with each other across uh, boundaries. That had never happened before. Yep. So we were able to do some really, really good things for the African continent. You, you mentioned uh, earlier how some people thought, well, AFRICOM was going to come in only because the U.S. was interested in oil and other things. Well, we were interested in oil. We were interested in how to allow Africans to protect the uh, uh, from the theft of oil off the coast of Africa. So we were able to put together with the African Union a structured maritime strategy. Now, I'm, I'm hoping that uh, the U.S. can return to working with the African continent on developing a maritime strategy that will allow African nations to protect their coastlines, uh, not only from the theft of, of fish from off the coast of Africa, but from the theft of oil off the coast of Africa, and also to, present, to prevent the drug trafficking mm -hmm. that, I mean, you take a, a little nation like Guinea-Bissau, at one point was completely overrun by the monstrous drug traffickers. Uh, Guinea-Bissau had two or three little boats mm -hmm. in its entire arsenal, and, and most of them did not even work. Yep. But drug traffickers had planes, boats, and uh, money, and all that kind of stuff. So Guinea-Bissau had a hard time defending itself and protecting its interests. AFRICOM is able to help nations like Guinea-Bissau strengthen its capacity, uh, working not only collaboratively with the African Union, but working collaboratively with the African Union partners as well. Otherwise, uh, China is going to build a maritime strategy uh, with the African continent uh, and other nations will do so. I think it's better if we do it than it is uh, with other nations doing it. No, I absolutely agree. Um, so you've got your copy of the book. I haven't gotten mine. It said respond by I, December 7th. I haven't I, gotten it. I bought it. You know, oh. I, I'm still waiting on my free copy. Oh, okay. I'm uh, waiting on my free copy. I, I, I was about I ready to put down $160 and purchased my copy of the book. Oh, look and, at that. <laughs> and read the book. And when you read all of the chapters, Chris, yeah. you will be tremendously grateful that you wrote a chapter in this book. Well, that and, was my uh, hope. Yeah, yeah. He did. Your hope was fulfilled mm. because and I'm glad that the editors accepted our balancing of the rest of the book. Not that the rest of the book is bad because it's not. It's a good book. It's an excellent academic piece yes. on uh, strategic studies. And I encourage everybody to read it. But it would have been a horrible academic piece had it not had your chapter and my chapter. And I'm not saying that uh, in, in any braggadocious way. I'm saying that in a, a way that is reflective of, of truth. No, no, I, I absolutely believe you. I mean, as I was being fully honest there, my concern was, and, and not looking at any of the particular um, authors, that, that wasn't a concern, but the fact that there were no Americans involved in the project when I was asking involved, I'm like, um, you know, I mean, if I was going to write a book about South Africa and it was a collaborative effort, I wouldn't take, you know, Nepalese, Americans, Argentinians and no, and no, and no South Africans. I mean, come on. <laughs> I mean, you know, whether you're on the right or left or in the middle, you would have to have some South African expert because there is expertise Absolutely. there. So, yeah, well, I, I'm glad to hear that, we, that it balanced out that way. You know, it's interesting. Um, before we talk more about the book, there's a few things just come up that you talked about. When, when we talk about U.S. Africa Command, when it started up, a lot of people... I mean, the whole argument was, and you read my chapter there, that, well, it's all about counterterrorism. Well, it wasn't about counterterrorism. In fact, when, when Africa Command first got its, its sea legs under it, no pun intended there, but when it got its sea legs under it, um, 
that was almost no focus whatsoever for the command, not even for Special Operations Command. They weren't even focused on that. And I remember very specifically a program that from the outset, I was in Liberia when the command became active. It was a subunified command and I was rebuilding the Armed Force Library and then it became, uh, it took over the Security Cooperation Offices in May 1st of 20 or 2008. And uh, one of the first programs they started pushing to us right away, which European Command was not doing, and this is because Eric Threat was there. He was a Naval officer, a commander there, or a Lieutenant Commander at African Command. He was given a pot of money and um, told for go go forth and do great things, but he had some guidance and they worked on this pandemic response program. And the idea was to help African governments, not just the military, but African governments develop uh, plans and the capacity on how to deal with pandemics. This was in 2007, they came up with this idea, 2008 we put in place. When the Mono River region Ebola outbreak took place in December, 2013 was reported by Médecins Sans Frontières and a few others and the world ignored it until August of, of, of 2013 or 2014. That's when the world started paying attention. Um, what happened was that the Nigerians had a few people come back from Liberia in that region who came in with it. And the Nigerian health services acted instantly. And, and they did immediate contact tracing. They isolated, quarantined those people. Now, they deserve all the credit in the world, in my view. And I've been praising the Nigerian public health system for that response uh, because I thought they did a bang-up job when other people were saying that the U.S. Army did a great job. And, well, we did some useful things, but but Africans really solved the problem, in my view, in the Mono River region. But anyway, so, so I've been praising the Nigerians endlessly about that. And the thing is, is that... Um, to be fair, um, it wasn't entirely unselfish because uh, from my perspective, part of the reason they were able to respond in that fashion is that they embraced the concept of the pandemic response program that U.S. Africa Command put out there and they participated in it and it paid dividends just a few short years later. That's one example of things that are something that the military forces could deliver that someone else could, couldn't do, and it wasn't taking over people's sovereignty. We, we didn't even tell them what to do. They could use it or not. And there are a lot of programs like that. Africa Endeavor, which was, as you talk about, getting African militaries to work together regionally and continentally, uh, which was never done in the past. The OAU never did it. The African Union never did it. We did that. No, the European Union didn't do it. Now, others have done similar things since then, but the U.S. Um, Africa Command is what really got it started. Yeah, it really did. And, you know, I, I had the opportunity of working very closely with General Ward mm -hmm. and very closely with General Ham. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the General Rodriguez, I think, was the third uh, uh, general. I was there when he was uh, installed, but I did not work closely with him because I left. But General Ham and General Ward uh, would often uh, come to Addis and I would have consultation with them. And they would ask me my opinion about how AFRICOM can work most effectively on the continent. And I would always remind them that the military does more for people in a nation when people see the military as a part of the people, yeah. a part of the nation that can work collaboratively to do good. Yeah. And doing good has a lot to do with uh, pandemic responses, responding to floods, responding to famine, uh, uh, getting aid uh, out to remote areas, helping communication from uh, remote villages to capital cities, uh, building transportation systems, teaching people how to repair uh, jeeps and trucks and cars, teaching people how to put together electrical grids. All of these things that the Army Corps of Engineers has been doing for ages. African nations can learn tremendously from that. And that's really what AFRICOM was able to do. And, you know, people have the impression that the U.S. had no military interest or coverage of Africa prior to AFRICOM. That wasn't the case. <laughs> it had coverage. It was just scattered coverage. What AFRICOM simply sought to do, as you pointed out exceedingly well in your chapter, was simply to bring together under one umbrella a structured way of relating to the African continent. And now, you know, when you talk to people at the African Union, uh, they have a great appreciation for what AFRICOM has been able to do. I'm hopeful that at some point the rapid response unit that we had talked about trying to develop at the AU would come to reality because the African Union has what is called a non-indifference approach to intervention. The United Nations, on the other hand, 
I'm not a non-indifference to the African Union. The United Nations has a non-interference policy. Now, the way they differ is this. The United Nations cannot get involved if there is an extra uh, constitutional coup, a military coup or something like that, unless invited mm -hmm. because it is uh, non-interfering. Right. The African Union has a non-indifference policy, which means that the African Union by law must get involved if there is a coup or some other kind of devastating thing that happens in an African nation. But what the African Union does not have is the capacity to get engaged. So what a rapid response unit will be able to do would be able to allow the African Union to match its capacity with its responsibility. Absolutely. I was going to say here that, um, you know, when, when the when the command was stood up, when it was announced and I was in Africa and then people were approaching me all the time and I go to conferences and talk to Africans all over the continent. Yeah, well, well, who are the, who's the United States to, to have a command for Africa? Who do you think you are? Well, listen, whether we like it or not, our military has global responsibilities. When there's a tsunami in, in Indonesia, uh, the Navy, the Seventh Fleet responds from Pacific Command, now Indo-Pacific Command. When there's an earthquake, you know, somewhere else, we do this. When there's when there's a war somewhere, we're engaged. When there's, you know, we don't have a choice. Um, just that's the geostrategic realities. And I said, in fact, you know, instead of um, taking offense to Africa Command, I think that Africans ought to feel you know, complimented that, that, that the U.S. Department of Defense is now saying that Africa matters. It's a place that's important. It matters geostrategically and it should get the respect that it needs. And therefore, we'll have a single four star general who goes to Congress every year and justifies a budget to work with our friends, partners and allies in Africa for the betterment of Africans and in our geostrategic interests. Instead of dividing amongst three commands that were disjointed, and you had seams and, and gaps there. Now you have one commander responsible for U.S military uh, actions under a diplomatic envelope in Africa. Right. And I said, that's, I think Africans should feel complimented by that. And people are like, well, yeah, well, nobody does. I'm like, well, uh, you know, look, uh, South Africans look at Africa and they look at it in different ways. We don't tell you how to suck eggs. Um, and, you know, when people, people are like, well, what if Africans don't approve? I'm like, well, who cares? I, I said that in a cheeky way. I'm like, who cares whether right. Africans approve? This is an administrative reorganization within the Department of Defense. It doesn't mean any change in policy necessarily. It can lead to change, and it did. It did, but it doesn't mean that policy is going to change. We were involved in Africa supplying arms to uh, to Zaire and Mobutu for decades. We were involved right. in supporting Ethiopia militarily, and then when they had the revolution became a Soviet client, we switched over to Somalia. We've been involved. We had Liberian military base back in the Second World War. We've been in Africa. We trained the, the frontier force in Liberia. Um, several successive African-American army officers went there to do that. So we've been involved in the African military for a long, long time. And, yeah, uh, and th I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah. You know, and, and, and people don't recognize it sometimes, but um, Ethiopia um, uh, has supported the U.S. military in some of its uh, uh, interventions as well. Yeah. And so peace and security on the African continent is a factor of American concern because it is a factor of global concern. Uh, I think now if you have a conversation with most African leaders, uh, they see the benefit of the of the U.S. Africa Command because they see the benefit of U.S. engagement on the African continent. Uh, academics, and I'm an academic by uh, background, uh, having uh, uh, taught philosophy and religion at university level and having been president of a theological seminary, I know how academics think, and it's important for academics to be uh, uh a critical in a substantive manner, but it's also important for academics to be practical, mm -hmm. where academics have to look at the, the practical realities as well as the structured theoretical realities in terms of its analysis of anything, to include AFRICOM. The average president on the African continent, the average person on the African continent, when they see the benefits as they have seen of the presence of U.S. engagement, uh, not isolated from U.S. AFRICOM engagement, but U.S. engagement as a whole, they are tremendously pleased that the U.S. is present. And part of the U.S. presence is AFRICOM. 
No, absolutely. And, um, and so for me, um, writing the chapter was, um, in some respects, kind of a labor of love. I mean, I was with Africa Command, um, I mean, technically, since Vice Admiral Mueller was appointed to build the transition team. And I was back at the Defense Intelligence Agency working at the Pentagon and briefing him and a small team about Africa, which they didn't know much at all about Africa on a frequent basis. And then I went to Liberia. And then the command was stood up. And so I spent uh, all the time, basically from 2007 until 2015, nearly a decade in one form or another, either in Stuttgart for one tour or somewhere in the continent under Africa Command. And and for me, those, those particular tours, none of those were attache tours. They were all were all security assistants because I kept getting drawn into that hole. I guess they liked what I was doing or they couldn't find somewhere else to put me, whichever the case was. So so I was actually part of Africa Command from the very outset until that time frame. And so my, my experience has been over multiple commanders. You mentioned all three of them there, um, General Ward, whom uh, I thought was the right guy at the right time in the right place for that job. That was my view on it. And then we had General yeah. Ham, who was a good transition. Uh, and then uh, General Rodriguez was a very different kind of character, but I enjoyed working under him as well. It was a tremendous experience. But um, from your from your perspective, uh, the book itself, um, was, was there any part, of, well, I should say, you mentioned the editors. I, I, w- I would have to offer my, tip my cap to these guys. Uh, as you said, uh, they gave us great latitude and um, they didn't try to force us to change our content, whether they agree with something or not. Uh, they did have questions about clarification, but these were specific things that I explained. Unfortunately, a couple things had gotten out in the public and people had thought that that's the way things were, but the public was mistaken. And so I had to clarify that. So I just clarified a few times and it made sense to them. But, but from your perspective, um, what was the... Um, most uh the most enjoyable part about writing this chapter or did it just flow from your 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 mind right away and and your keyboard or did did it something you had to really think hard about no well i i I thought hard about it because i was trying to do uh three things in the chapter one i was trying to chronicle my uh four years Mm -hmm. at usau uh two i was trying to uh justify the value of multilateral diplomacy as a logical augmentation of structured bilateral diplomacy and trying to show that there is no disharmony between bilateral diplomacy and multilateral diplomacy. And then thirdly, I was trying to show uh, how AFRICOM fit as a part of larger U.S. engagement whole of government U.S. engagement on the African continent. So when you read my chapter, there is as much about multilateral diplomacy as there is about AFRICOM, and there is as much about chronicling the uh, relationship between the U.S. and the African Union, uh, and also the U.S. and the UNECA and briefly about my role at AUPG. So I was trying to do those three things, chronicle the four years, uh, advance the notion that multilateral diplomacy is a significant augmentation to bilateral diplomacy and to see AFRICOM as a part of a whole of government structured approach to the African continent. And they gave me the latitude to do that. In fact, they, they did push back once or twice wanted me to do more on AFRICOM exclusive. And I said, no, I'm, I need to talk about multilateral diplomacy because AFRICOM fits into uh, the picture as a part of a multilateral approach. So I, I, I resisted and they accepted my resistance. Uh, they did ask me to mention more uh, people. So then I went back and I talked specifically about uh, the role that Jendaya Frazier, Condoleezza Rice, George W. Bush uh, played the role that uh, Secretary Clinton, uh, Secretary Kerry, and uh, Assistant Secretary uh, Johnny Carson uh, played in the whole of government approach to the African continent. So I was really pleased that they accepted uh, the chapter uh, as I presented it. No, that's awesome. And, uh, you know, I have to say that um, 
uh, you know, the whole world's been affected by the Ebola situation, or not Ebola, sorry, the, yeah. the, the COVID-19 situation. Sorry. COVID-19. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Fading back to previous days, Ebola. But uh, yeah, so um, uh, even we were. I mean, uh, this thing was supposed to be published a year ago, and uh, at least that's originally told. So I was all excited about that. And I, I was I was also, it was going to be published before I retired, and I was kind of excited about that because um, mm-hmm. I didn't have the RET on there after Colonel on there. So now it's Colonel retired. But but yeah. uh, but uh, we, 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 we we had to wait because uh, some of our co-authors were in Italy, uh, I think one or two of them, and, and they couldn't complete the project with all the chaos going on in Italy this time last year. So it's finally there. It's finally published. And um, now I'm going to have to break down and, and, and order the thing and while I wait for my free copy just so I can read the whole book. I'm fascinated. Yeah, I, I, I got tired of waiting on my free copy. And, you know, I had shared with some of my academic friends at uh, different universities that it was coming out. And I wanted to make sure that I read the book in, in, in its totality. Uh, uh, you know, I, I co-chaired the uh, Biden campaign's Africa uh, policy team. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, uh, and I wanted to also make sure that uh, the book as a whole uh, did not end up being something that would have been uh, overly controversial. That's one of the reasons I wanted to read the whole thing. So I broke down and, and paid the 160 bucks and ordered it. And uh, I'm glad I did. Now, I think that I'm going to have to do the same sort of thing because I've been, I've been dying to read everyone else's chapter. I'm, I'm not worried about what your chapter says, but I, I'm a little, little apprehensive about what I'm reading some of the other ones. So I'm going to have to break down and get it myself. But uh, yeah, no, it's, uh, it is, it's nice to see it come to fruition. Now, uh, this is something I got to ask. Um, uh, in my previous effort in a collaborative effort like this, where I was publishing a book, um, my editors chose my chapter title. I didn't get it. So they came up with a very, for my chapter in that book, a very unsexy, very, very, mm. very um, esoteric looking chapter. Now, now I just, not, not to put you on the spot, but your, your chapter, so people know, it's uh, Multilateral Diplomacy in the Formation of the U.S. Africa Command, Reflections on mm-hmm. U.S. Africa Policy and Engagement from Bush through Obama, t- 2000, 2016. That's right. a great title, but that's a long title. Was that your title or did the editors come that up was, with it? That, that was my title because I insisted on that title because I wanted to cover the the, the, the three things. Mm-hmm. Well, it's, uh, it's there. It says it. Started, it started would not have covered it. Yeah. I wanted to cover multilateral diplomacy, and, and you could not cover multilateral diplomacy on the African continent without talking about George Bush uh, because of his positive role in that. Yep. And you could not talk about uh, uh, the co- collaborative of my experience at USAU without being able to put it in some kind of context. And you notice uh, the AFRICOM part of it uh, was stuck in there as well. I wanted to do three things. And, you know, I've published a lot of times before. And so I know what it's like to make sure that you argue to get your title the way you want your title. Because your title is descriptive of, should be descriptive of what you plan to say. Uh, it's like choosing a dissertation topic. You know, you choose your own dissertation topic. Your committee doesn't do that. And uh, I was not going to let anybody choose the topic. So I chose the topic. It's a long topic, and I knew it was long, but it had to be long in order to cover what I wanted to cover. No, it, it's, it's, it was very descriptive. I've, that's why I was curious. But uh, it, so, so you have chapter three. I have chapter four. Mine is the genesis oh. and origin, origins of U.S. Okay. Africa Command. Now, I will I will say this. Uh, they did entice me by telling me that I had the lead chapter in this book, and most important one. Then I saw them come up. Wait a second. Ambassador Battle came before me. Uh, that sounds like false <laughs> advertising. I, I want my money back. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but no, I, I, I happily, uh, happily uh, concede uh, because in order to, to, to get that, well, actually our chapters could come in either order, but both, I think the way it's done is the right structure. Now, let me ask you a question, uh, Chris. Yeah. Did, um, did you uh, do all of the, the, the you know, they, they have a lot of footnotes uh, behind your uh, chapter. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are 74 footnotes. Yes. Uh, and, um, uh, and I noticed that with, with my chapter, there were a lot of footnotes that I had not uh, put in, but I'm glad that they did. Uh, it's just an academic responsibility to do uh, a careful footnoting. Uh, so they took some of the things that I said, and then their research team went back and found documentation 
that validated what I had already said. Mm -hmm. So uh, you have 74 footnotes uh, on your chapter. I have to go back and look at how many I have. I mean, I don't recall if it was 74, but it was certainly a fair number of footnotes. Uh, now, a number of mine are from interviews. So I'm, I'm citing right. interviews, but uh, there's also there's also published source in there too. Yeah, no, I, right. I, I made an effort to, um, the problem I had is, well, not the problem, but the thing is that a lot of the stuff that I refer to, there were there were the ways to cite it, but unfortunately a lot of it was, um, not a lot, of it, but some of it was, internet-based stuff because it was newspaper articles that were written in opinion pieces or or statements that were published in newspapers because there was no academic work done at that time, virtually none. So, because when I start with the origins, now when it comes to the assessment of what is Africa Command, what did we get, what, what, what is this car now that's a decade old, a decade old plus, um, there's those footnotes are more recent and cite some academic articles and feedback there. But but uh, the natural thing was that the early part of this involved a lot of interviews like Teresa Whalen and other officials involved in this. And so those interviews are the early parts of the footnotes, plus some press releases and some media things. And then later you get into more academic and published books because then, then it's kind of a it covers a lot. Like you, I covered a, a wide range of time there. Right. And there were different developments. But, yeah, I, I, I went to great lengths to, to cite these things. And the thing is, uh, most here's the thing, Ambassador battle i could have written this without interviewing most of these people without doing any research um i, I but i you know you know how it is you don't want to prejudge what you're doing i laid out a a a, 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 um, a template of what i was going to look for what questions i wanted to ask from the middle and what i thought to be both sides of the argument and then i went after them and i asked and then depending on what the interviews did and what i read and research you know you adjust right but um but in the end uh my conclusions and what i wrote honestly are pretty much what i thought and um, and that's not that's not being egotistical or, or, or biased or arrogant. I mean, it's just uh, having lived it and been involved in it. Sometimes that's detrimental. You know, you're too close to it. But I was at right. but I was at all levels. I was I was on the ground in Africa. I was in embassies. I was at the African Union. I was in Stuttgart. I was the Pentagon. So I saw it from all different angles, and I think that gave me a unique perspective to help write this chapter. And so in the uh, end, it gave, it gave you an excellent perspective, and and it is clear when a person reads your chapter that you were on the ground, mm -hmm. that you were intimately involved with uh, the formation process, that you knew what you were talking about, that you were not writing this uh, from an abstract distance uh, academic point of view only. You were writing it from a person who had academic capacity, who understood the need for documentation, and at the same time who had personal experience. You know, uh, being a seminary president, dealing with people who are uh, taking homiletics classes, uh, classes in, in, in preaching. Um, we often say to people that if you preach a sermon, the people who hear that sermon have to genuinely know that you care and that you have some passionate connection with what you're talking about. Well, your homiletics and your hermeneutics were excellent in this chapter. You do an excellent job. And people have people can sense your personality as you write the chapter, and you will be exceedingly proud of of your work when you see it. And when you read the other chapters as well, it will even make you more proud of your having put the perspective of Africom from its origins, its genesis, in this book. So I think we did America a good job by writing these two chapters in the book. Well, that's awesome. But now now I feel wholly negligent. So the next time I have you on as a guest and we talk, whether it's about chaplaincy or it's about Africa or, or anything, because uh, I'm going to invite you back. But uh, the next time I'm going to have to have, 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 have coughed up and stopped being frugal, pay the 160 bucks, read the book so I can say complimentary things about your chapter because I haven't had a chance to read it yet. And that's the thing I really look forward to. But thank you. That's very kind of you. Those are very kind words. Folks, you're listening to Chris White Africa on the Adaba Africa channel here on the Adaba Broadcasting Network. 4th of February, 2021, my special feature guest today is Ambassador Michael Battle, former ambassador to the U.S. African, U.S. Mission in the African Union. And uh, we've run through the hour. Uh, I don't know. If, can you stay a couple more minutes and maybe we can wrap up or, or you got to take off? Well, if, if, if we could wrap up in five minutes, I'll be good. All right. Yeah. Well, then what we're going to do is I'm going to I'm going to turn it to you, sir. And I'm going to ask you if, if there's anything that you'd like to share, either from the book project experience uh, from U.S. Af U.S. Mission in the African Union, the U.S. African, anything and thoughts about U.S. engagement in Africa, uh, any of those topics you want to share with the audience, because we have people all over the world who have an interest in Africa who watch this program. Okay. What, I, what I would like to uh, do, first of all, is thank you. 
uh, both for the chapter that you wrote and also for having me as one of your guests on, on the show. What I'm hoping for as the African continent moves into uh, the next 10, 15, uh, 20 years, that there is a global engagement. Uh, the world needs Africa to develop mm -hmm. as a continent. The natural resources, the human resources, the, uh, the agricultural capacity of the African continent. You know, the United Nations has already predicted that in the next 20 to 30 years, one out of every four pe persons on planet Earth under the age of 35 will be an African. That means that one fourth of the future of planet Earth is going to be African. So the world has to engage with Africa. We can no longer have a whole continent that is described at large as poor mm. and as poverty stricken and as developing. The world needs Africa to develop. The world needs Africa to have an industrial revolution. The world needs Africa to be able to employ its people to be able to uh, feed its people, to be able to end poverty uh, on its continent. And if that happens, the rest of the world will benefit. So I'm hoping that the US, that Russia, that China, that uh, 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 Israel, that uh, uh, South America and everybody will get engaged with Africa as a partner yeah. to develop the African continent because the globe needs it. Well, that's well said, Ambassador Battle. Uh, Ambassador Michael Battle, thank you so much. It's been a distinct pleasure having you on. Thank you also for the very kind words you said about my chapter and my participation. I, I appreciate that. Uh, that's, that's high praise, uh, and I appreciate it very much. Uh, you are welcome back on the channel anytime in the future, and, uh, and, and maybe I'll get together with you sometime soon. We'll, we'll try to get you up and talk about some of these other topics. Well, thank you. Peace be with you, man. All right. Take care, Ambassador. All right, folks, that's Ambassador Michael Battle as he signs off there. Um, oh, that's pretty cool. I like that. It's critically important for youth to actively engage and define what they would like the world to like. That's pretty cool. Let me just go ahead and wrap up here very quickly, folks. Um, thank you all so much for tuning in. Uh, this has been a pleasure for me. I really enjoyed it. It was a long effort uh, to get this book to a publication. It's out there now. And it was a pleasure uh, having Ambassador Battle on as my guest. Um, I, I just wish I had a chance to work for him at the African Union or elsewhere in Africa. He was, uh, he's, he's a pleasure to work with and a delight and a wonderful human being. So folks, thanks for tuning in today. I'll be back with the Night Owls edition here in two hours and 25 minutes. Two hours and 25 minutes, 27 minutes, and catch you guys here again for that. Thanks for tuning in. Don't forget my guest tomorrow is Helmut Röma Heitman, uh, the premier defense and securities analyst in South Africa. He'll be joining me on the program tomorrow. Thanks a lot. Uh, give the video a like. And share it with your friends and your family. Let them know about it and appreciate it. And anyway, folks, uh, not, not, not asking people to rush out and buy the book. Uh, neither of us have a financial interest in it. But if you are curious, the link to the book is located in the video below this. You can go check it out. Uh, there's a link there to one spot, also to Amazon if you want to go buy the thing, uh, or you can get it from Walmart or somewhere like that. I don't know where you can get it in Africa, but that's certainly the case here in the U.S. But anyway, folks, thanks for tuning in, and uh, God bless. And we will catch you here in a couple of hours on Chris Wyatt Africa. All right, that's it. I'm out of here. And take care, folks.